Vayeshev. Uh, I want to focus on the story in chapter 38, and then we can get into a more uh, uh, focused study of it. I'm not sure how many people actually have read this story, so I'll just do a quick summation, right? Uh, because I want to focus on the tenaciousness of Tamar and the and what I call clinging to the covenant. It's something that we see expressed by the great matriarchs of faith. And it's like we see that Yaakov and Esau's mother, to great risk, even took upon herself the potential curse that would come from her conjoling her son Yaakov to take the covenant blessings. We see uh, Abraham's wife being involved in the relationship with her, their servant girl, and she bore a son, Ishmael, and to great risk of alienating, alienating herself from her husband says, you need to get rid of this boy, right? She just took a stand. And even the creator of the universe, God Almighty, told Abraham, listen to your wife. Listen to what she has to say. So women by nature have a tremendous tenacity about themselves, right? You guys, like, you can cling on to something and you're not going to let go. You know, hair lip every person between here and uh, the other world to, to do something, right? And especially if you're going to mess with their children. If you do something that's going to be against their children, uh, I'm telling you right now, uh, my wife wouldn't have had a, and doesn't have an issue defending her children or grandchildren, right? Because she'll go out there and make sure it's done. So with that being said, I'd like to look at the 38th chapter in the story of Vayeshev. Uh, in this 38th chapter, it says, At the time, it happened that Judah went down from his brothers and encamped near an Adullamite whose name was Hira, and Judah saw the daughter of, the, of a Canaanite there by the name of Shua. He married and cohabited with her. He convinced and conce she conceived and bore a son. His name was Er. She conceived again and bore a son. His name was Onan. She bore still another son, and his name, she named him Shelah. He was in Chesbin, I'm sorry, Chesib, Chesib, where she bore him. Judah took a wife for his firstborn, Er, uh, her name was Tamar, Er, Er's, I'm sorry, Judah's firstborn was evil before the Lord, and the Lord caused him to die. Judah said to Onan, which is the second son, go to your brother's wife and do your duty to her as your brother-in-law and provide offsprings for your brother. Now, being familiar with the story, we know that Onan refused to have a relationship with her, and when he did, uh, used um, a, a method that she wouldn't conceive. And it angered the Creator. Now, it says that they did evil. I mean, it really upset God so much so that the two boys died. It's like insanity. Judah felt, my boys died because of Tamar. Tamar must be the curse. She's the problem in the relationship. Why is this story important? The story of Judah and Tamar in Genesis 38 begins with the details about Judah's uh, first marriage to the daughter of Sh Shua, the Canaanite, and the birth of three sons. What is the problem right off the bat? What's the problem right off the bat that we learn? What's the problem with the first relationship? Well, if it is a Canaanite, it's forbidden. Absolutely. Now, amongst all of the sages that are listed in the Onkelos, there is one, Nemonides, who, who varies different from the rest of Redak, et cetera, et cetera, who says, well, she was not a Canaanite because very clearly uh, he wouldn't have violated this, this deal. Well, I am proposing, along with some research that I have, and I have the sources here, that there is a reason why this story is told, 
and that the the woman that bore the sons was not a worthy person to bear the son of Judah, who would be the ancestor of David HaMelech and the Mashiach. They were not worthy. And that's why they couldn't, they, they, the sons had died. Now, whether Tamar knew that she was going to be the great, you know, ancestor of David HaMelech and Mashiach, you know, well, it doesn't say. But very clearly, the matriarchs knew that they were carrying on a covenant line down through the generations. And they were willing to do whatever it took to cling on to the covenant. I mean, at great risk to themselves to do it. When you first read this story, and if you're not aware of the whole, the, sort of the satellite view picture of the matriarchs of faith, it seems a little creepy, right? That this, her, her, this Tamar seduces her father-in-law. Just like, woo, a little weird and uncomfortable. But when you realize that this man, Judah, was not going to have righteous generations that would produce the Mashiach, seems that she was well set to do whatever it took, even if it took her potential death. As a matter of fact, she stood before a tribunal, and they wanted to burn her at the stake. And being such a tzaddik, a tzaddikah, she refused to name to, uh, uh, Judah as the father of the child that she was pregnant with. And it was only after the judgment was passed that she passed the word to his ears to say, the child that is in my womb is the person who owns these items that she had taken or that was given to her as a, as a what do you call it, a, a commitment type deal. And it seems to be a signet ring and a, and a cloak that held that. According to this person that wrote a, a, a biblical text, uh, and I'll, I'll quote you the, the text. Let me run down to my sources on the bottom. Um, a Kariv, uh, the text is called Shivat Amudi Hatanak, written in 1968. This person uh, makes a, a statement that I find quite interesting. He says, the biblical author seeks to describe the home that Judah established and that, that ended in heartbreak and disappointment. Now, when we see heartbreak and disappointment, she named her children these kinds of words, right? The, the, the Canaanite woman. Uh, disappointment, all because this Canaanite wife was not worthy of establishing the line, quote, because of these foreign origins, none of the three were worthy of being the ancestor of the line from which the, uh, come kingship and redemption. His wife ex, uh, expli explicitly mentioned as being the daughter of a certain Canaanite. Now, Maimonides translates it as merchant, right? But Canaanite is merchant. That's what it means. I think it's Maimonides. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment when we start the discussion. Uh, what do you have? You have something different? No, I'm trying to understand if you're saying Nachmanides or Maimonides. Oh, I'm sorry, Nachmanides. Nachmanides? Yes, yes. Nimonides, hold on. I'll tell you right now. Uh, you would know that. Oh, here we go. Nachmanides. Okay. Yeah, very good. Thanks for to help me clarify that. That's fine. I, I'm from Louisiana. Me too. So it's, see, there we go. We can't even communicate. Right. Okay. Thank Not you. even two people from Louisiana can communicate the same. Okay. Uh, so um, it says, along with her sons, was uh, this, the sons were wiped off of the face of the earth, to include the woman. And another woman took her place, one who would be worthy of establishing the dynasty descending from Judah. Kariv's remarks makes perfectly clear why Scripture goes to such detail regarding Judah's marriage to the daughter of Shua the Canaanite, and the birth of her sons, verse 3 through 4. Judah's eldest son married Tamar and then died. We all know the story, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was displeased to the Lord, and the Lord took his life. Now, thank God we're living at the state we are, because when you're at such a holy place, uh, your life is at risk when you don't do things that please the creator of the universe. 
the reputation of the repetition of the word word for word of the, of the phrase displeasing to the lord coupled with the penalty of death foretells the continuation of the story in which judah accuses tamar of death of his two sons and is unwilling to let her marry the third son the details that scripture provides us concerning tamar's husband and the circumstances of their death inform us that tamar played no part in the demise very clearly when we read the text tamar had nothing to do with this tamar was an innocent victim judah having incorrectly interpreted the tragedies that befall him accuses tamar of her uh, of her responsibility of the death of the son seeing her as a woman who brings disaster here's the quote in verse 11 then judah said to his daughter-in-law tamar stay as a widow in your father's house until my son Shela grows up in the parenthetical remark, Scripture reveals to the reader that Judah had no intention of giving this young boy to Tamar. She was a curse. So Tamar waited. She accepted that Judah candidly and expected to be given Shelah in marriage. But as time went by, she observed that this was not going to be the case. A little side note. It says that Tamar, according to Midrash, that the reason why Judah did not know what she looked like because she always wore a veil in her marriage. So he had no idea what she looked like. But she veiled herself as well as being a prostitute. That's what they would do. And so he didn't know what she looked like. So this wasn't like he played along with it. He had no clue what she looked like. Now, let's move on. Tamar wished to bear a son who would continue the line of Judah. And having realized that she had been deceived by Judah, she took the initiative in a daring and dangerous way, disguising herself as a harlot. It says she, she made a pledge with him for his seal and cord. And there's, there's a sort of a debate as to the word translated, pe'il, meaning is it a coat? Is it a jacket? Is it a cord? And so it comes down to it's probably the seal that's attached to the cord that goes around the neck. Goes on, you know, when you put your jacket on. Uh, this, this would be the thing that he would found. When Judah found out that his daughter-in-law had become pregnant by harlot, harlotry, he proclaimed without least hesitation, bring her out and have her burn. Verse 24. As the story continues, our sympathy, obviously, I know mine, went out to poor Tamar. I'm thinking, oh man, she's getting the worst end of this deal. And a person of integrity is, is going to end up dying. I mean, potentially could have died in this. And then we also look at Judah as fairly disgraceful in his behavior, what was going on. Quote, as she was being brought out, she sent his, this message to her father-in-law. I am with child by a man who these belong to. Now, can you imagine how shocking that was, right? To find out, oops, that's, that's my ring, right? Now, the integrity of Judah immediately admitted to what was going on. Now, we can get into the whole thing, well, why in the world was he messing with a harlot anyway? All right, we can get into all the discussion with that, okay? We have to understand these were, these were different times. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not like it is today. So, uh, so at the end of the story, it is Judah who is, who is, at the outset, had seen Tamar as responsible for the death of his sons, who recanted and said explicitly these words in verse 26. She is more than right than I, inasmuch as I did not give her to, uh, to my son, Shila. Judah, too, is shown to be a great person capable of admitting his error. I think one of the greatest things that we learn from this story is learn to admit when you're wrong. That's a hard thing to do. Okay, so we all have ego shelves, and it's hard to admit. But I do believe that in the long run, uh, it's much better just to say, dude, I, you caught me. Right? Go ahead. You had something you want to say? There's a big connector here with King David. Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, Judah, you know, Judah just passed the scepter, the promise of the scepter, right. which is the 
kingship from his father mm -hmm. on his deathbed, you know. Uh, right. So Jacob, Jacob passed the scepter to Judah. Correct. Said he would never leave his family, and King David was known and he's adored today uh, amongst the Jewish people right. because of his openness to others and to Hashem about his wrongdoing. Absolutely, that's very which good. Is, which is a trait connected clearly Absolutely. to Judah. Absolutely. And there's also another trait that is, that is connected to Tamar uh, as being uh, a person who is very aware of of others around them and be very accepting of other people around them because we see this when it comes to the way Boaz treats Ruth's family I mean just like very generous very accepting to bring people into the tribe per se so we do see those family traits that are carried on and I do find it interesting and the reason why I titled this the tenacious, ten, uh, tenaciousness of Tamar is a tenacious uh, person is one who grabs a hold of something and doesn't let go You've heard of the example how to catch a, a spider monkey. Have you seen this where they take a gourd and they put a hole and put a peanut in it? And it puts its hand and it grabs a peanut and it won't, it won't let go of the peanut to get out of the gourd. And they just can walk over and grab the, the monkey and it's trapped because it just can't let go of the peanut. That's tenaciousness. Tamar had such tenaciousness to do what was right. She was willing. She was willing to make the sacrifice. Now, even though the scripture doesn't explicitly say this, clearly we understand that this woman was a woman of great perspective, and she understood the seriousness of this whole thing. And I don't think that Judah was, was you know, uh, not concerned about it. I think he figured, you know, the right woman will come along for my youngest son, and that's where the line will, will go through. But she wanted to be a part of the covenant. And that's the incredible thing. This is a woman who says, I've been left out. It wasn't my fault, and I'm not going to blame anybody. But I want to make sure that this, I will be sure to raise my children like the matriarchs have raised their children, like my mothers have raised children. And so she had this extreme tenacity to make sure that it gets done. And it's interesting because uh, in, in chapter 28, there's a birth of children here, and it says, which begins with the details of Judah's first family, concludes with the birth of Tamar's twins. Now, what was the issue with the twins? Do you remember something that happened in the story? Do you, what was the story? So one of the boys' hand came out, and what did they do? Tied a, string. Tied a string. Why in the world would they do that? Right, so we're not going to re the, so rectification of what happened with Jacob and Esau. They're not, they're not going to repeat that deal again, right? So the great lesson here is that the next generation says we're not going to make this mistake twice. We're going to make sure that we do it right. And it's interesting because it says one of them reached out and the midwife tied a crimson thread to the wrist, but when the other suddenly burst forth and she said, what a breach or in Hebrew, Perez, you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. This was the Perez who came and be the ancestor of the divinity line. What does this story signify? The conclusion of the story is the inverse of the beginning. The beginning describes Judas' failed attempts to establish a family, and the end clearly indicates that how his true family was formed. Though he had a plan, that was not the plan that Hashem had. Abraham had a plan, and Sarah had a plan, but that is not the way Hashem had it planned. The antidote about this uh, struggle to be the firstborn aims at reminding the reader of many other con test of first birthright and inheritance going back to Cain and Abel. Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, and many others. This particular detail puts our story into the group of narratives dealing with the sons chosen to continue the line. Meaning that at fine, at, it, it seems that this story sort of cinches up the idea that it is important to know who or where the line of the tribes are going to come from and who's going to come from these lines and now we understand why that in a modern age they say that Judaism is passed through the, the, the matriarchs 
inherited this great reward to be the ones who passed on the line of Judaism from one mother to the next. In conclusion, this is the place to point out Judah's first two sons were never again mentioned. Whereas Shelah is mentioned in the families belonging to the tribes of Judah. Numbers 26, 20, 1 Chronicles 4, 21 through 23. Uh, nevertheless, the family of uh, Shelah uh, is not considered important to the tribe of Judah. And in the Chronicles is listed but briefly after a lengthy detail of the family's descendants from Perez and Zerah. Radak commented on this as follows. He quote says, All the gener 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 genealogies mentioned thus far are descended from Perez and Zerah. Thus far, thus, far, thus, thus far the sons of Shelah had not been mentioned. So now when completing the genealogy of Judah, brief mention is made of sons of Shelah. So the idea here is that the reader realizes that Judah's acknowledgement of Tamar was right. What he did was the right thing. What she did is sort of sordid and odd as it was, was the right thing. And so sometimes we have to do things uh, because of the sense of tenacity that others might think is a little like crazy. But the tenacity to cling to Hashem and cling to the covenant is very important. I think for all of us, we have come from a, a background in which most of your friends and family and former associates think that you've lost your mind when you have made the decision to do what you have done. But it is that tenacity that you had that says, I'm not letting go. I don't care what you think about me. It's not even material anymore. One of the biggest things my wife and I often say is, you know, we'll hear something that someone says and we'll go, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? It just doesn't matter what somebody else says. Because my tenacity to cling to Hashem is more important than anything in the world. Anything in the world. And so for all of us and for the B'nai Noach and the Ger and whatever else you want to call yourself, the righteous of the nation, you need to have the tenacity of the matriarchs to say that the covenant of God is more important than anything in the world. The Torah is more important than anything in the world. And therefore, I'm going to cling to this and I'm going to hold to it. I don't care what if the whole world isn't doing what I'm doing. I'm going to cling to this. And that, my friend, we learned the lesson from Tamar, uh, the tenacity of Tamar. And that concludes the shore. We can have a discussion now. It is a lot to discuss. <laughs>